It starts when we are so very young. I have a very clear memory of myself at the age of four or five, hearing my mother having a conversation with one of her friends, and part of the subject was me, oddly enough. Little, little Johnny is not peeing while he's standing up yet. Aren't you worried about what that might mean? <laughs> Now at age four or five, I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that there was something wrong with the way I was doing something. At the age of 10, my friend across the street knew where to find his father's stack of Playboys. We went over them with a fine tooth comb I had no clue what sex was, but I knew, even at that age, that that was something that men were supposed to pursue, whatever it was. It was very, very important. At the age of 12, much like Oliver Button, I could not make the basketball team. I had pretty much topped out at the height I was always going to be. Thank you, genetics. But I also was not very athletic at all. I was picked last for kickball. I was forbidden to even think about playing football. I had no athletics in my life at all. I was not doing the things boys were supposed to do. At that same age, I was still struggling to learn how to swim and going to Boy Scout camp for the first time. And in front of all the other boys, there I got my little beginner swim tag. I was only allowed into the shallow end of the lake. The junior leader nicknamed me that year Puka, which I learned later was slang for gay. By age 14, I had discovered what was really my passion in the theater, and by a freshman year in high school, I was tagged theater fag and bullied in the hallways. And I couldn't have said a thing about it if I wanted to, because don't you know boys will be boys? By the age of 17, getting ready to graduate from high school, everybody was obsessed with who was a virgin or not, and here I was still definitely a virgin, and my friends asking me constantly, did you get it yet? No. Don't worry, said an older friend of mine. There's some girl at college who'll take care of that in the first week. By age 18 and in college, the message is still kept on coming. Even though I was in a theater community among people who shared the same passions that I did, the messages were still there. Women were only valuable for their desirability, their ability to play the ingenue. Women could only have certain roles within the theater, front stage and backstage. Women weren't supposed to be funny. Women could only work in the costume shop. The carpentry shop was the realm for the boys. Relationships based in abuse were all around me. And even into adulthood, as I entered into the working world, working for a transportation company straight out of college, why, John, why are you working at the desk job with the women instead of out in the vans with the boys? moving on into larger and larger companies. Why are you so worried about having enough time to spend with your family? Don't you know that you can only be a company man or a family man? Those two things don't go together, and you're going to have to pick if you want to be a successful working man. And even here, as I move into this role of ministry where I have a bit of a public persona and a little bit more high status, I hear the message that my spouse, my life partner, is just an extension of me, an appendage. And why can't you keep her under control? <laughs> Don't laugh, I've heard it here. This is just a brief catalog of the messages I have received about what it means to be a man. 
my whole life. These are just the highlights, the things I can remember thinking about it for a couple of weeks, the things that I can speak out loud without wanting to scream or cry with rage. And I know, I know I'm not alone. I know I could probably toss out the rest of the sermon and we could pass around the mic and we could probably do a whole morning of group reflection and sharing, men and women, about the messages we have received our whole lives about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman in relationship to a man, because that's how we define these things. The short version of this morning's sermon is this. We are steeped in a culture with a narrow and harmful definition of what it means to be a man, a gendered man in this world. And it has placed us inside a claustrophobic bubble of very limited gender norms. And generations have lived inside this bubble and passed these norms down, generation to generation, grandfather to father to son to grandson. On and on it goes. And many of us over the generations have lived inside this bubble without ever questioning whether it was right or not, at least without ever questioning out loud. But what happens? What happens when someone dares to ask? What happens when someone just pokes a tiny little two-minute hole into that bubble? Bullying. The Me Too movement against sexual harassment. Toxic masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? What I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. Once, but she says it's a problem. And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing. To act the right Um, way. Bro, not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big. Y'all men, they're everywhere. And small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today I'd like to say the whole world woke up after that debuted a week before the Super Bowl and that here endeth the lesson, but I cannot. Some people got it. Some people appreciated the message, but a lot of other people, and frankly, mostly men, lost their collective minds about the message. Public misogynists, people who who make a living bloviating on the television about men's rights, pooped their collective pampers over what Gillette was trying to tell us here. (laughs) What, we can't even barbecue anymore? Someone commented about the message on there. We can't be men, we can't be rough and tumble. Oh, what are they trying to tell us? People started to want to boycott Gillette. People were posting pictures of them throwing their razors into the trash. No less than CNN's preeminent misogynist, Piers Morgan, said, it seems to me that Gillette is telling us to take their razor blades and cut off our testicles. (laughs) Side note, if Piers Morgan bloviates in a forest and there's no one around to hear him, is he still wrong? (laughs) Over a commercial 
We lost our minds and started a conversation. Yet again, a year and a half or more after the idea of Me Too started to enter into the national conversation, women sharing their stories of abuse at the hands of men, the idea of toxic masculinity entered the national conversation once again. It is a triggering term for some. It causes a lot of consternation. It causes a lot of confusion, mostly among men, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it is a reality, and we need to talk about it, and we need to understand it so that we can counter what it is and the harm that it does. Gender studies professor in Sydney, Australia, R.W. Connell, posits a theory called hegemonic masculinity. It's an attempt to explain why things are imbalanced in the way that they are. And she calls hegemonic masculinity a practice that legitimizes men's dominant position in society and justifies subordination of women and other marginalized ways of being a man, specifically those ways of being a man that might be perceived as feminine. And the definition of masculinity might change from culture to culture and from era to era, but here and now it's rooted in this very basic sense of the man as the breadwinner and the woman as the homemaker. And one of those has much more value than the other. And already, that's not a healthy way to approach the world. But then the definition of man starts to get narrower and narrower. A man must project confidence. A man must project emotional control or outright suppression of their emotions. They must not express their feelings. A man is strong and silent. To be a man means to practice an overt physicality, a physicality that borders and crosses over into aggression frequently and unnecessary risk-taking and very frequently violence. To be a man is to be sexually promiscuous, to rack up the notches on the bedpost, and let's be clear, heterosexually promiscuous. To be a man is to always be in a constant state of looking at the world as us versus them, us being men and them, everyone else who doesn't fit into that care category. There is always an enemy. There is always a winner and a loser. Growing more and more toxic, the more we restrict what that definition is, and it moves into outright toxicity when these norms are attached to a gatekeeping process. When other men have the ability to label others as men based on their ability to conform and to comply with this narrow definition of what it is to be a man. And this conformity and this complicity is enforced more often than not through violence or through the threat of violence. And that threat is always there. Even at the age of 14, I knew that when they were calling me a theater fag, I knew what was implied in that label. I knew the violence that was implied. And even if I wasn't wise enough to figure it out, the daily bullying sure as hell brought it home. Manhood is earned through conformity to these norms. And through this conformity, a man can be assured of dominance in the world and the assumption of their ultimate value in the world over and above everyone and everything else. 
and it is passed from generation to generation to the point where we just assume that this is just the way it always is, that this is how men just are and how women just are. And don't you know, boys will be boys. What are you going to do? And the harm it does to the world is immense. Toxic masculinity manifests itself in the world in a myriad of ways, in the most extreme, through that practice of violence against men and against women, especially against women. Statistically, currently today, 52% of women have experienced some form of physical violence at some point in their life. 25% of all women have experienced physical or sexual assault by an intimate partner. 70% of all assaults have been perpetrated by an intimate partner. One in five women have experienced rape in their lifetime. One in 13 murder victims who are women were murdered by a husband or a boyfriend. And 99% of this violence is committed by men. Hold on to that figure for a second. We're going to come back to it. 99% of violence against women is committed by men. And we may or may not care that it happens. Look at how we talk about rape in today's culture. Women are raped, but we don't often talk about who does the raping. Men who go to trial for rape are often valued more than their victims. The Brock Turner case in the last couple of years being one of the prime examples of that. We can't ruin this young man's life, all the potential he has, because of this one mistake that he made. Never mind the harm already done. And what were her contributions to the situation? How was it the victim's fault? This is how we talk about violence done to women in our world today. And lest we place this all on women, there is violence done to men and toxic masculinity as well. Homophobia is a big, big symptom of this culture. That's the extreme. And I'm leading with it to get it out of the way for one thing, but also not to let you off the hook. Because it's easy to look at those statistics and say, that's not me. I can look at those statistics and say, that's not me. I have never done that. And yet, toxic masculinity causes us to behave in ways much more subtly harmful to those around us, to ourselves and to others. Because my value is based on my masculinity and my access to that title because I have earned it. I can assume my ultimate value, and therefore others, especially women, are of lesser or no value. Women in this culture have nothing to contribute to the equation, except at the level that they can be of some use to a man's further power and value, and usually that comes in terms of our sexuality. And it comes in the message that women don't belong in certain careers. Women shouldn't be funny. They shouldn't do carpentry. They shouldn't work in STEM. And this translates to less pay, fewer promotions, a, second, a sense of second-class belonging in social circles. In the professional world, and in the social world, women are interrupted by men frequently or outright ignored or dismissed or assumed to be wrong. I've counted numerous times just in meetings here at church where I've heard a man speak up to say, speak up, I can't hear you, when a woman is contributing her ideas into the room. Sometimes this might be because of an actual hearing loss issue Frequently? Probably not, because the culture trains us to literally not hear women. This plays out most 
pervasively in culture now with the popular idea of mansplaining. Many of you have heard the term by now, I'm sure. It took root just a little over a decade ago uh, through American writer Rebecca Solnit, who wrote an essay called Men Explain Things to Me, talking about an incident at a cocktail party she went to where she was talking about the new book she had just written. She had just written a biography of Edward Muybridge, a pioneering photographer of the 19th century, talking to a man, explaining what she did for a living as a writer. And as soon as she brought up Edward Muybridge, his response was, oh, did you hear about this really important book about Moybridge that just came out? And proceeded to explain her own book to her ad nauseum. And she shares the story, and lo and behold, more and more women are able to tell their stories about how things they knew quite a bit about in their old fields of expertise were constantly explained to them by men who thought that they knew better. It's a result, says Solnit, of overconfidence and cluelessness. It's that confidence, again, that men must project. And the assumption that a man must know more in any sphere that they're walking through. Rooted in an assumption that men are more likely to be more knowledgeable about a subject, especially in work spheres that are traditionally male-gendered, the sciences. To mansplain is to comment or explain in a condescending or oversimplified or overconfident or inaccurate way to a woman something she probably knows already and might know better than you. It's another triggering term like that term toxic masculinity. Whenever we hear the result, let me back up here. <laughs> I have six pages of handwritten notes and I'm going to start getting lost a little bit here. The result of all of this, from the extreme violence down to the annoying crap that happens every day, means that we have lost women at that table of creation I was talking about in the prayer, whether physically, whether their lives are lost, or whether they have been pushed out of careers because they are not valued enough, or whether they have removed themselves from the table and spears just because it is too stressful and too annoying to have to put up with the shame and the frustration of the assumptions made about them and their value to the world. Now men, in a great percentage, when we hear these terms, when we hear toxic masculinity, I know that is a triggering term for some of you in this room, or it's a confusing term, because I've already had questions about it since the newsletter came out. Or we hear a term like mansplaining, we duck into this defensive mode, we get really, really nervous, and our hackles go up. Why? Why is this so triggering for us? Partly, and ironically, it might be because we are frustrated by the notion that we might be devalued as an individual based on our membership in a wide gender group rather than being judged on our individual merit. I wonder what that feels like. <laughs> it might be because a sense of pride is so attached to this definition of masculinity that we fear a diminishment of our own self-worth, of our own identity, of our own pride. Or it might be that if we stopped to think about it, we might have to reflect on what it is that we have done or we have abetted. We might have to reflect about the ways that we have been complicit and compromised our own selves to get to where we are today. We might have to reflect on what it is that we have been handed by our fathers and our grandfathers. We might have to reflect on what it is that our circle of friends have participated in. We might have to stop and finally realize that it is not just women who are harmed by this culture, but it is men as well. Just last year, the American Psychological Association called toxic masculinity one of the great harms to men in our culture. And a 
have been able to link it to an increase in everything from heart disease to suicide in the male population. Because we're stressing our own selves out trying to keep up with this. Why do we avoid the subject? Because we fear. Because we are deathly afraid of what it might tell us about ourselves. Aaron Brook on Twitter, who writes a lot about these subjects, did a very informal poll amongst her male and female followers on this subject of fear. Once we were able to dive down and realize that fear was the central emotion that was keeping us from dealing with any of this, all right, she asked, tell me what it is you are afraid of. And for men, that fear comes back to that fear of loss of status, of pride, of facing reality. And for women, that fear was almost singly focused upon the fear of violence to their own selves. Men fear loss of pride, and women feel fear loss of life. They fear the violence. And in the end, the reason we should be caring about this at all is because it all comes back to this violence. Not just the extremes. Because even the mundane, subtle, stupid crap that gets perpetrated day after day after day is a form of violence. It is a spiritual violence to women and to men. It is an emotional violence. And there is so much damage done it is our reticence to face the reality of all of these forms of violence that drives our reticence to deal with it. The culture programs us not to want to deal with it. We talk about Me Too as being a women's issue, separating it from the men who are intimate parts of those stories. We talk about toxic masculinity as a women's issue, even as it's got masculine right in the title because we are looking at who is affected and not is who is affecting. Even in our legal language, we talk about violence against women. But what's missing from that equation? There's a trick in writing. They teach us how to tell when you're speaking in the passive voice, if you can add by zombies to the end of it, and it makes a complete sentence. You are speaking in the passive voice. Violence against women by zombies. But it ain't by zombies, folks. No. Like I said in those statistics before, 99% of the violence perpetrated upon women and men in this country is perpetrated by men. And we have let the language we use remove ourselves from the conversation. But once we've named it, once we've named it, we cannot ignore it. Once we have named it, we have to face our own role and the roles that our friends and our families have played in the perpetuation of this system that does so much harm, we have to face the role we have played in the violence. But John, not all men was the hashtag that went around as women started telling their stories because men crouch into a defensive position. I'm a good person. I'm a good man. I have never assaulted anyone. I have never raped anyone. Great. Neither have I. But. And this is the big but, and this is the moral of the story today. I have been complicit. I 
I have allowed it to go on. When I do not speak up in the face of verbal abuse or physical abuse, when I see it happening, when I do not intervene, I am complicit. When I'm age 19, sitting in a college party, and I'm listening to two idiots bragging about how they tricked some girl into taking her top off, and I just turn away, I am complicit. When I sit at a meeting at a church, and I watch a woman interrupted, or spoken over, or ignored, or told to speak up, and I do not say anything, I have been complicit. And I'm sorry. We begin to break this when we end the silence. Silence is consent to the system. Silence is part of the program of toxic masculinity. Because, hey, if you can't conform, if you, John, or Oliver Button, you are sissies, maybe we'll let you in part way to the club if you just shut up about it a little bit, all right? Yeah, you're cool. Come on in. Breaking the silence is the first step. We have to speak up. And really, that's all that ad from Gillette was asking us to do. How horrifying. Hey, say something when you see something crappy going on. Ah! <laughs> Speak up. Intervene. Say something. Say something before someone takes one more step into that toxic waste dump we are all living in. say something especially to all of our younger men, to our sons and our nephews and our mentees and our students, because it's so much easier to counter it while those minds are still impressionable and you can tell them the right way to be. And don't just say something to stop them before they do something. Tell them your story. Do that little inventory like I did up at the front of the sermon here. Look at the moments in your life when you got the messages that just screwed it all up. Call them out for the lies that they are. Speak in those moments. And then the rest of the time, this goes for the men especially, maybe we need to learn to shut up a little bit. We've got to listen up. When you're hearing the Me Too stories, when women are speaking about their experiences with men, we need to listen. When anyone, man or woman, is calling us out on our behavior that is contributing to the cycle, we need to listen. And we need to listen to absorb it. We need to listen to understand rather than to come up with our gut response. That is a really hard skill to learn, and human beings are bad at it in general, so I understand, but that's the listening we have to do in this case. Because when we have reached our own learning moment, we have to stop and learn, and when women are speaking to us about their pain and their experiences, our opinions about how they got there don't mean a damn thing. In fact, I'll say that today is not going to be the last word on the subject. This all came about because a few years ago somebody asked me, why haven't I preached on the Me Too movement yet? And the answer was because I don't think the women in this congregation or anywhere else really want to hear what I have to say about their stories. This is not the last word. The last word won't come from me. Speak up to intervene and listen the rest of the time. And in the midst of all this, as much as it may hurt our pride or our sense of self, cause us to reevaluate what it means to be a man in today's world, learn to live with that discomfort. Discomfort's good. It's one of our best teachers. 
causes us to reflect if we don't get too reactive with it. If we resist it, we just get more and more numb and we just fall into worse and worse patterns. But if we can notice where we're resisting and actually stop and separate ourselves from ourselves from a moment and say, why am I feeling what I am feeling? What is the reason for that? We start to learn so much about ourselves and we change. And then we have that much more power to speak when we need to speak and shut up the rest of the time and do what we need to do to break the cycle. And when we have done that, don't ask for a cookie. <laughs> this is not a Herculean task. This is us doing literally the least we could have been doing the entire time we've been on this earth. treating everyone around us as though they were a whole person valuable in and of themselves. What a concept. Do not ask for praise. Do not stand in the Superman pose. Basic common decency man is literally the most boring superhero that has ever existed. Nobody wants to read the comic books. Nobody wants to go see the movies. They just want it to be the reality we're living with every day. Get over ourselves and just do it. Our only reward in all of this, as it should be, is that we are taking a step together one more step towards building the world we have been proclaiming to the rest of the world the whole time. I've been saying for months now in this ongoing series, what we are called to do is live our principles into truth. They are not real yet. All we can do is live them as though we are true. And we cannot do this if this is not part of the work. There is no worth or dignity if we cannot help break the cycle of toxicity in our gender relations. Our interdependence is threatened and poisoned as long as we live into that poison. We have to do this work. Is this the best a man can be? Not yet. But it's not too late to get there. And it can start here, and it can start now. I pray it may be so.